Continuing my inspection fest from yesterday, I just want to talk briefly about the Atari Jaguar today. And god, yeah, what a, what a console. Originally released in 1993, it was Atari's sixth programmable console, and it was marketed as the first 64-bit video game console, which seemed crazy at the time. It was jumping the gun over 32-bit, which we'd just gone on to from the 16-bit consoles, and here was a 64-bit machine. How could this be possible? It didn't appear completely different from the consoles we already knew. It only had an RF output, an expansion port and a power in, and two joystick ports, which were similar to the 9-pin variants, but Atari had added a few more pins. And it also took cartridges, which kind of went against the swathe of CDs which were starting to appear. I guess that's kind of where the Atari Jaguar fell down. A, it was very difficult to program for because it had a multitude of complex chips, it had two main chips, and to make it 64-bit, there was two 32-bit processors doing the grunt of the work, so it wasn't really a 64-bit processor in itself. But it did have some games which came out which really captivated my attention especially, and you know, Alien vs Predator was definitely one of them. Under the hood we have the Tom chip which runs at 26.59 MHz and the Jerry chip which is a digital signal processor and there's also a Motorola 68000 used as a management chip in there. And the console came bundled with Cybermorph which was distinctly underwhelming. I mean it looked good in screenshots but as soon as you play it you realise that the draw distance is so short you're just running into things all the time. Alien vs Predator followed, but it was a bit late to make a massive impact, but oh, that was a great game, it looked the part. Tempest 2000 was also an amazing game for the system, it wasn't graphically amazing, but playability, it was it hit the spot. Now one thing which always puzzled me about the console was, these games came out which didn't really seem to fit with the architecture, we had Wolfenstein 3D, we had Theme Park, and we had a lot of 16-bit ports, that's kind of what happened with the Jaguar. Lots of developers managed to get the 16-bit ports across with the detailed and complex architecture, but not much else, and there was a few good games, as we've already listed, but not enough to make an impact. Atari tried to change the fortunes of the machine by launching the CD-ROM add-on, which was very unreliable and didn't make much of an impact, and they also had a virtual reality headset, but it never made it to the consumers, although there was one game, I think Missile Command has support for it, and you can see some demos of it being used on YouTube. It's a shame because it's a console, it's one of those things like the Amiga 1200, I saw it and I really wanted one, I didn't quite know why, I think it was the 64-bit name, it just, it just sounded amazing, and it looked amazing, and it was the latest technology, and you know, Compared to 32 bits, this was double the power, pretty much, in my child mind, so where could you go wrong? But unfortunately, you know, the PlayStation was just around the corner, the Saturn, and people were kind of waiting for them, and the Jaguar didn't take off like Atari had hoped, and this was combined with manufacturing problems, bad marketing on Atari's part, you know, they started off by running this alongside the development of the Panther console, which I mentioned in a different video in a different context. Originally, the Panther console was designed to be a competitor for the Mega Drive and the SNES and the 16-bit consoles, and this was supposed to be, the Jaguar was supposed to be the high-end console. But the Panther got cancelled because the Jaguar was developed ahead of its schedule, but then they didn't market it problem, and you know, all the normal sort of Atari things happened. And then Atari released the Falcon computer and that died, and then Atari died! And it's a sad story because Atari, you know, they'd done well, they could have kept doing well. Just a few bad mistakes that tripped them over. Anyway, let's take a look at some of the better games for the console. So we start off with the pack-in game, and that is Cybermorph. And this looked good in screenshots, it did its job, but you know, the draw distance is just so short, it's very hard to play, and it became synonymous with this woman. Good work. Now Her voice would pop up all the time. Next we have Doom, and this is a very good version of Doom. It was actually programmed by John Carmack himself, and console versions get a bit of a beating, but this deserves no beating. There's no music to it, it's very doom and atmospheric, it's definitely worth playing. As is this game, and this is 
Alien vs Predator. When I saw this game, I was blown away. This is what made me really want a Jaguar. You might notice there's some kind of black shadows around those alien creatures there, and that is because it, this is actually footage from an emulator, and it's so hard to emulate a Jaguar because of its complex architecture, but people have still got problems with it today. Anyway, this was an amazing, amazing game, and it's amazing to play as well. Okay, and then we move on to one of the most addictive games on the platform. This is Tempest 2000, a take from the arcade game. And this is probably the best version of Tempest you're likely to play. I could spend hours absorbed in this. It's got an awesome difficulty curve. The graphics, you know, they're not amazing. They're quite simple given the game's context, but it's very good. And one of the must-have titles, along with Alien vs Predator. Oh, and all the excitement, I forgot to mention the controller. The controller itself is an absolute behemoth. Look at it, it's huge. And it gets knocked by a lot of people, but I actually quite like it. You've got all these buttons on the bottom, which you know, some people say it's too much, but then you could get overlays which went over those buttons, and it turned it into like a keyboard. You had access to use uh, weapons on demand, like in Doom, you could just press different buttons to bring up different weapons rather than cycling through them. And you've also got the three main buttons at the top, pause and option buttons, and a pretty solid D-pad. So I don't think it deserves all the hate it had. It is quite chunky in your hands, but it's not difficult to get used to as a controller. Deal with it. Anyway, that wraps up this Atari Jaguar inspection. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed looking at the console again. I'll do a full review on this console in the future because it definitely deserves it. But for now, that's all. Thanks for watching.